Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and today I'm joined by Robbie Ferguson. He's co-founder at Immutable. Immutable is a platform for building Web3 games. And uh, we're going to talk about Web3 gaming today. Uh, we're going to talk about the gaming market. We're going to discuss also Immutable, uh, their whole developer platform, and uh, some of their some of their products, and uh, understanding uh, where Web3 go- gaming is going uh, generally. So, Robbie, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Zep. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, w- w- tell me a bit about your background and like how you um, came to want to focus on uh, Web3 gaming. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, I've been building technology startups for the last decade uh, as a software engineer, uh, originally self taught, and most of these I built with my brother and my co founder, James. Uh, in fact, we actually started out by building a League of Legends betting application where you could automatically wager on your own matches. Uh, so I, I think we had, you know, we were massive gamers growing up. I think we had this thesis pretty early on that uh, games were incredibly important, that the assets inside these games could be valuable, and that there was something that was being locked away from gamers. You know, back then we didn't know the technical architecture of that. Um, but I remember even playing RuneScape on a shared account I had with my brother. And one day, uh, I decided to take his account out of the wilderness. I think he had full dragon and I scaled and I lost all his items. And I felt so bad that I went online and I spent all of my pocket money and I bought in-game gold so that I could buy his items back. And the next day, the account was banned for real world trading. Six months later, Jagex rolled out first party support for real world trading as long as the issuance was centralized and controlled through them. Um, and so I think it was pretty obvious the, you know, the impunity with which people regarded these economies and made changes to them, even though they were incredibly important to people's lives uh, and, and to some extent their, their financial li- livelihoods, even in Web2 economies where it was limited to a database. In fact, you can make arguments that the first ever sort of you know, real-world trading of digital assets was probably World of Warcraft. Um, and indeed, you know, Counter-Strike Go through this essentially Steam-locked database today did $32 billion in volume over the last few years. So I, I think it's obvious that there's a problem and also that there's a need. There's a demand analog in the real world over these assets being traded or wanting to be traded and they're really not being a good solution or infrastructure for it. Um, so we, we we started building you know, more tech companies. Uh, we got into the crypto space in 2014 with Bitcoin. Uh, we basically just got exposure financially. I thought it was kind of interesting. I wasn't super obsessed. But when Ethereum came out, I became a, you know, a believer. Uh, I remember using Etherall and just becoming obsessed with this idea that someone could take what a, you know, a, a gambling company spends billions of dollars or, or the government does ensuring that the payouts on slot machines are compliant, that they have uh, the probabilities rated between what their payout ratios are, 88 to 92 cents here in Australia. And they literally heuristically test this. They have to air gap the machines. And then someone built this little app called Etherall. It did all of that in 200 lines of code. And then it did something that the companies and the government could never do. It took the revenue streams from this institution or this enterprise, and it gave it to every single person who used the protocol through tokens. And I was just obsessed with this idea of decentralizing and making companies cooperatives. I thought it was the way that capitalist incentives could finally solve some of the inherent problems in society, I was sold by this idea of a decentralized Uber where all the riders could go in the network. Now, it turns out that did happen. It just happened with on-chain financial products because the friction was much lower and you already have native product market fit with these 100,000 DeFi traders slash airdrop farmers slash early users of Web3 today as kind of your core um, whales who are, who are moving money around. And uh, we, we basically started building trading bots for a few years uh, on top of Poloniex initially and, and then on decentralized exchanges. But we always wanted to build something. And so at the start of 2017, my brother and I wrote a white paper called the Distributed Autonomous Bank, or DAB, which was effectively compound. And we hadn't solved all of the collateralization problems of lending protocols. I, I don't think they're solved today even, but we were about to launch it when five ICOs went to 50, went to 200, And we just got very cold feet about the space from a a reg and compliance perspective. We thought a bunch of people were going to jail. uh, And we wanted to build something that would be long-term feasible 
and that we would be happy to grow incredibly large without having the SEC knock on our door at, when it gets to a sufficient scale. And so we scrapped that, but serendipitously at the same time, um, the first ever NFTs came out in this idea of a crypto punk. And we, we saw these and we said, this will be how gamers own in-game items. And actually the way we, we started was we built the first ever multiplayer game on any blockchain. It was fully on-chain logic. Uh, it came out in December of 2017. It was called Etherbots. Uh, and you could basically battle robots and, and win real uh, NFTs by by having your your machines win. They were composable of four ARC721s. You had a fully on-chain perk tree. You can play a game today and it'll cost you hundreds of dollars, but it can never go down. And so I think we learned pretty early on, you know, what should go on-chain versus watch it off. And that really formed the thesis of how we started to build Immutable, which was build first-party content much in the same way that Steam or Valve started out with Counter-Strike Go, and then we're able to leverage that knowledge and uh, that sort of beachhead from the content perspective into building a platform that everyone could use. And that really solved core needs. And, and so, you know, Immutable today, uh, we're, we're nearly 300 people around the world, much more if you include the, the contracting on, on game development. Uh, we have hundreds of games building on us. Um, we, we had more than a billion dollars invested in games building on us just last year. And we've significantly increased our market share since then with this Polygon partnership. And we've raised, you know, hundreds of millions from everyone from Temasek to, to Tencent's first investment in the space. Um, and our whole mission is how do we deliver on this promise to to Web3 gamers and to gamers worldwide on true digital asset ownership? Yeah, you said something in the beginning, which, you know, kind of, kind of struck me as interesting is that you you said that you were, you I think it was League, League of Legends, um, that you, you had bought this gold and, and then ended up buying some assets to sort of Re, re make make good on your on having lost your brother's uh, assets and that that account was banned for real world trading. Uh, what well, why do uh, gaming platforms and uh, game publishers uh, prohibit or you'll know, want to prohibit or keep or in the case of, of this game having then allowed real world trading? Why do they want to keep that sort of centralized and within uh, within their platform? So I think. Before now, it, the technology hasn't existed. I think it's impossible to do with databases. Uh, the availability of being able to change something means that companies will. And that means you can't form third-party trusted ecosystem. Even if the current CEO wants to make a uh, trusted third-party ecosystem, you know, people can't trust the incentives and financials enough to actually build real enterprises. You saw this with Opskits, which is a $300 million third-party marketplace for CSGO skins that basically went belly up when Valve implemented trade locks and they limited skins from being traded more frequently than once a week. Uh, and so I think there's actually just this technological impossibility and political impossibility with everything that doesn't rely on, you know, um, open, trustless, immutable architecture such as NFTs. But isn't, isn't that a design issue though? I mean, so there, there may be the technology issue, but there's also like the, the design yeah. aspect. So, you know, whether you're building on a centralized database or you're building in a blockchain, the, the designers of say the smart contract or the and maybe this is getting a little bit in the weeds here sort of early on but um the the design essentially is is in the hands of the developer or the issue of that of that uh, of that game and so i mean couldn't you build a similar sort of design in the game where you have like an admin key and that admin key gets to decide who is able to trade or what what the trading mechanisms might be you can so i, I think the technology is only one half of the picture and the answer to that in Web3 is, I mean, if you work really hard, you can make things properly trustless. And in general, they're, they're much more trustless. For instance, if, if someone does a change they don't like, you know, people can kind of you know, fork those assets or, or find out some other ways to bring value to them. But in general, what we're relying on is incentive alignment, which means that uh, the publishers have an incentive to grow the value of that ecosystem and grow the value of those assets because they now have access to things like royalties and secondary market fees, rather than having to rely on this old model of I sell stuff, I deprecate that and, and make them more useless by releasing more powerful stuff that people want to buy every year. And, and, and so I, I think it's it's a fair point. Um, and it's it's certainly not you sort of overnight solved unless you're doing fully on chain trustless games, which, you know, uh, are certainly not this cycle. Um, I think we're seeing some interesting experiments, but it's web 2.5 games that are going to go mainstream first. Um, but the second question and the probably much more important one is just economics and incentives. I think this model hasn't existed before. I think it's difficult for games companies to see how they can, you know, for, for a long time, actually succeed off growing the value of these economies. Um, and you have to remember as well, like 
In-game items being the biggest portion of spend is also a reasonably new phenomenon. Free-to-play gaming only came out in the late 2010s, and that's when you had in-game items as even something that was really important as a vast majority of monetization. The majority of monetization is now in-game items, uh, and we're, we're sort of seeing this pressure towards, well, how do we actually create better economic standards and better property rights for gamers because of this. But 20 years ago, this was completely irrelevant because these, you know, these, these sort of economies were incre increasingly small uh, and didn't have that much relevance to, to players. Um, so I think the answer now is it's a bit of both. It's how can we prove out to developers this is a better and more aligned business model, while at the same time, you just have innovators dilemma. People are going to be disrupted. Uh, the, the goal we're going for is... We want gamers to demand property rights. If they play a game and they get given something in a database, that should be not good enough. And that's the point at which it's no longer sort of market to, to have a game that runs on a database rather than on open property systems. Yeah, interesting. We can get a little bit more into this a little bit later, but uh, uh, I just want to pull on that thread a little bit. You know, what is it that people, like maybe take a snap back here. Like what is it that people understand the least about game development, you know, you know, there's, there's this whole there's this whole uh, kind of narrative around Web three games and how Web three games are inherently better than the you know, the traditional model. But like game development is a really, I mean, it's a huge industry. It's like a two hundred billion dollar industry. Games and game development is expensive. And like there's all these um, there's there's all these considerations around like licensing and publishers and distribution. And I mean, it's, it's a very complex industry. Um, what is it that people understand the least about it that you know bears understanding if they're going to be building a Web three game or if they want to go sort of in this direction? I, I think the first thing is probably timelines and how they get produced. The reason that DeFi bull runs correlated so quickly with DeFi innovation is Andre Cronje can put together a test smart contract and call it a production smart contract in a week, right? Uh, like you can build DeFi applications very very quickly. They're all open source. They're highly composable. Uh, people can fork and, and sort of remix things. Uh, building a game is not at all like that. It's like building a movie. You have a budget of roughly minimum $5 million for anything reasonable, unless you're looking at truly indie hits, all the way up into the hundreds of millions of dollars um, for sort of, you know, Bethesda quality games. And, and even then, you will not be able to produce a Bethesda game unless you have the capabilities and processes of Bethesda. There are a few, very few studios with sort of that uh, internal capability and, and risk tolerance. Um, and, and the time it takes is a lot longer. And then you combine that with the power law of gaming, which is that uh, gaming, particularly free-to-play games, conform to a power law, which means that the biggest game will have more revenue or more players or more volume than number two and, and to the end. And the second biggest game will have more than number three and, and so on to the end. And what that means actually is when you look at why we haven't had a hit yet, or, or the one hit we've had was, was sort of... Uh, Axie, which was sort of medium sustainability, obviously had a, had a sharp drop off, is there simply hasn't been enough shots on goal. And one hit is going to dwarf everything else combined. Um, you see this already in, in Web 2, Counter-Strike Go doing $32 billion in volume over the last three years. Or in revenues, you, you see that same topology. Um, Axie then is, is roughly, what, five or six billion. Uh, and everything else is lower than that combined. Um, and I, I think we're, we're going to see that, but the failure rates are going to be incredibly high to start with, 90 to 95%. Uh, and so the reason we have such a broad platform play is we know there are going to be so many shots on goal and all that matters is they have sufficient funding to be one of those hits. And then we just have to make everyone as successful as possible and, and sort of focus on those top 100, top 200 opportunities. And, and what are the biggest challenges then? I mean, like you said, there's like 100 games on Immutable and... You know, we've seen other games like Axie and there's the whole like sandbox ecosystem. What have we learned so far about Web3 games that we've identified as like the biggest challenges to like hitting those shots on goal and like really demonstrating that this new sort of infrastructure and this new paradigm of gaming is inherently better uh, and, and I'm making suppositions here that, that uh, you know, than, than traditional games. I think there's probably five big problems blocking successful games being ready now and uh, available. And we think about this problem a lot. And our goal as Immutable is to be the one-stop shop that we could solve everything for, for a mainstream developer if they want to build something. Uh, I'll go through and I'll, I'll say where I think the, like, the market is at today. So I think the, the five problems are 
um, security and, and choice of technical architecture. Two, user experience for onboarding mainstream players. Three, developer experience for mainstream developers to build a successful blockchain game without having to touch things like Solidity. Fourth, having a sustainable and easily built economy. And five, the game design itself and and the the actual game production quality kind of getting live. Um, and, and that's the one we have the least control over. That takes time. Uh, it takes uh, game studios being built. Um, and we've had a lot of that investment. So that's kind of you know in progress and, and we're seeing stuff start to go live and, and we'll start to pick up the pace increasingly over the next 12 months. Um, as to the rest of the board, I think we've actually made massive progress. So the first one, security, I think this is basically now solved. Um, this was always something we were never happy to compromise on. It's the reason we didn't go down the path of side chains, even then that was the most favored sort of VC thesis for, for how you should build a valuable company was building an ETH killer or an ETH alternative. Um, we always wanted to build on the thing that already had liquidity and had the best security. And we wanted to do so inheriting that security, which is why we're basically you know the, the first uh, ZK wallet for NFTs, why we, why we chose this architecture from day one. Um, the second is user experience. And this was in a really bad place. Uh, by the way, on security, if you make the wrong choice here, you know, your platform is dead and you lose all brand sort of security and trust with your customers. So this is a non-viable condition that companies have to be incredibly careful about. Uh, and, and it doesn't just extend to, to inherent blockchain security. It's also the quality of your wallets. Are they self-custodial, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that's a really important decision. Second is user experience. This is probably honestly the, the most basic, but also the most important. If you ask a mainstream gamer, I, I, you know, I even think friend tech is a perfect example of this. It was able to go viral within crypto and no further. Because as soon as you have that viral coefficient, which might have been just above one with, within Web3, you cut it down to like 0.1 as soon as you require anyone to go through Web3 onboarding. If you're required to learn what a wallet is to bridge, you lose a huge amount of your users, 90 to 95% of your users. And so we need a way of making this like downloading a game in the app store and paying. Uh, and I think we've come a very long way here. We have fiat on ramps and off ramps entering maturity. We have uh, things like immutable passport where you can literally sign up to a wallet that's self-custodial in under five seconds, sign on with Apple, sign on with Google, sign on with email. And, and I, I, that's kind of our view for the long term is this has to be completely invisible to the end user while still maintaining self-custody as the default. Otherwise, again, we're just building a glorified database. Number three, I think developer experience is really interesting and has been overlooked by the vast majority of platforms and blockchains. A lot of people have invested in better frameworks for writing smart contracts, EVM compatibility. They are important, but they really service a hardcore use case that DeFi builders and people building right now. What our belief is, is 95% of developers will just want to build using APIs like Stripe. Uh, and I think without that usability, it's incredibly hard for this thing to take off. I mean, even you have like Curve Finance, advanced builders using a early version of, of Viper and then having a, a re-entrancy bug that was not even really auditable. Um, and so the, it, it's terrifying to build stuff using open smart contracts. You have brand new security concepts that do not exist in Web2, things like re-entrancy, which are literally not sort of uh, concepts that you, you encounter in conventional programming. And then on top of everything, you have immutability and financial contracts that, that inherently deal with money which I, I think is just terrifying um, as somebody who was originally a Web2 engineer and obviously had to learn Solidity and, and build on chain products. Um, the fourth is economies. And this one is really interesting because I think that had Axie had a sustainable economy, Web3 gaming would already be mainstream. Because what you have in every shift in gaming is, and, and there's been three major shifts in gaming over the last couple of decades. You have the free-to-play shift, the social shift, and the mobile shift. Uh, and then within that, you have different game designs emerging based on each form of distribution. But with, with each form of distribution, basically you have early hypothesis, a few people taking bets. And as soon as someone has a mainstream success, there are a thousand copycats. That becomes the new default form of distribution, huge in forms of investment. And it basically becomes a commodity, how to build a successful game design for that game distribution or genre. You saw this with Farmville. You know, Farmville spawned the social game genre. You had Mafia Wars, also created by Zynga, skinned into 15 different games that were literally the Mafia Wars code under the hood. They just had, you know, its skin for teenage girls with like a beauty salon uh, or, or, or lots of different other modes. And that's actually what we need in Web3. If Axie had a sustainable economy, I'm not throwing shade on Axie here, I'm just saying the reality of it was it was a bet that became extremely viral and then failed. But if that was sustainable, suddenly we'd have all of the copycats like Stefan 
seeing sustained success. And I, I think that's what we need. It's why we build immutable studios so that we have to force ourselves to think through first, from first principles, how do we design an economy to be sustainable and, and work with things like, you know, the natural growth curves or, or, or churn at different games. That's incredibly important. And that needs to be just super simple. Games should not have to go and have to hire like five PhD economists to succeed in Web3. It has to be like, oh, cool. I'm building a gacha game. Here's like the open source template for building a gacha game. I might add some tweaks and make a hit like Genshin Impact, but really I'm innovating on core gameplay loops and retention, not like some really intractable stuff around economies. And, and five, and actually I didn't even touch on this, but like liquidity fragmentation is also a huge problem. I realize I'm talking a lot, but I, obviously it's something I'm passionate about. No, these are these are great points. So you could... liquidity fragmentation is is like the the hidden demon of the blockchain today. It's the reason behind the fact we even have ETH killers is because everyone says in a fantastic article, Chainlink God, Chain Rotation Thesis, you know, uh, you have a bull run, Ethereum hits congestion. Congestion creates the narrative fodder for someone to create an ETH competitor saying ETH doesn't scale. They raise cash because they need to bootstrap liquidity from scratch for that alternative blockchain. Uh, and then they are able to seed uh, DeFi and create sort of artificial metrics on that new uh, blockchain in order to seed some interest. And we've seen that happen time and time again with every single bull bear run cycle. The difference with the next cycle is we now have L2s and L3s that can scale Ethereum, the most secure and most liquid blockchain in the world. And our vision is, well, how do we just remove fragmentation whatsoever? How do we make it so no matter what L2 or L3 you're using, no matter what wallet you're using, no matter what marketplace you're trading on, no matter what game you're trading in, you can trade com completely atomically completely seamlessly with any other trade in the world. And I, I think that's incredibly important because everything I just said, marketplaces, rollups, uh, wallets, and user funds, they're each fragmented to whatever particular product you're using that particular in time. And, and so we're having no network value created from everyone depositing. And, and like, this is what Apple does. Everyone thinks it's really easy to pay for things in the app store. It is, but at one point you actually had to sign up and give them your credit card details. You had to KYC, you had to register your username. That's why you can double click with your face. And you have to do that for a million different times, for a million different like liquidity moated uh, onboarding platforms in Web3, when we just need everyone to come onto a single source and, and start to be able to use their funds everywhere. I think that's kind of the, the really important underlying network that every bit of value has to be accruing to. Um, so those are the five things we think about. I think the majority of these are, are either solved or will be solved in the next six months. Um, so we're finally at the point where games are actually capable of succeeding purely based on the infrastructure that they're using. So all, all these all these points, like these five challenges you cited, what you, you when you were going through them, did, to me they just seem like the same challenges. They're, they're, they're crypto challenges. They're not just get crypto gaming challenges. They're the, they're the challenges for any crypto yes. adoption, whether that's social networks, whether that's DeFi, whether that's whatever application you want to build on crypto. Uh, and, and I think some of these are getting solved, right? Onboarding is getting solved. Security is getting solved. Um, liquidity fragmentation. I think we're in the early stages of solving that with trust minimized bridging and stuff like that. I really think that that's going to be one of the big uh, leaps ahead in the next cycle, the next four to five years. Uh, developer experience. And we're, we're doing quite a lot of work here, I think, on uh, on a couple of things, which is our, our global order book, which basically aggregates and propagates liquidity to every marketplace that integrates uh, with our wallet, which uh, is self-custodial, but doesn't lock your liquidity per game, uh, which is what the majority of other sort of, you know, easy sign-on wallets do as well. Yeah, I want to talk about the wallet a little bit too, Passport. But so I read on, I read on one of your blog articles that uh, it says that immutable, so you, you guys sort of expect that 40% of the $200 billion gaming industry will shift to Web3 in two to two and a half years. That I, I read that and I was like, that is a very bold claim. Um, do you think that in two to two to five years, all of these problems will be solved and there will be enough incentive for 40% of the gaming market essentially to drop what they're doing and and move to web three i personally think this this claim is is, is a little bit uh optimistic <laughs> yeah I, I i don't actually I, I don't necessarily agree with that claim except i, I think the timelines are a bit aggressive on that uh but i it, you know it, it could be referring to you know 40 percent of the market being um sort of the, the minimum bar of the amount which are in-game items 
uh, and you know our conviction is certainly that's going to shift. I, I think it would take a decade to shift for, for the whole thing. Um, but I think we'll start to see it snowball as soon as you have, like, I think the key inflection point is there's probably two coming up, right? The first hit that says sustainable. And then second is this ability to go to cost, like customers in web two and say, here's a much more effective model for running your games. And suddenly we're not just choosing out of people interested in building web three games. This becomes something you can pitch to everyone. And it's like pitching them, hey, you should also launch your game on consoles, not just PC, because this is now a thing that makes you way more money and is a way more successful way of, of doing games. You were, you guys were just at uh, at Gamescon uh, in in Cologne. So for those who don't know, like Gamescon is like the it's like the DevCon of games, right? It's it's this massive conference that happens in Cologne every year. Actually, I was surprised to find out uh, that it's more like a B two C conference than a B two B conference, which I find is interesting. But but basically, it's like you know the the biggest games conference in the world. All the game developers are there. All the big publishing houses that they hold the entire industry is there. I'd like to get a sense from you, like, because I asked a friend who was there. Like, we're we're just down the street from 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 Ubisoft here. Like, I have a couple of friends who who, uh, who work there, and so I was asking your friend, like, hey, like, you know, w- were there a lot of Web three games there? And his sense was that like there weren't that many, or like he didn't get a feel that a sense that the, it was it was a big part of like the the narrative at the conference this year. Um, so I'm curious if if you like echo that sentiment and what is the general approach that incumbents like ubisoft like 2k like ea like these big game publishers you know how do they look at uh web3 are they adopting it do you you know i I guess my question is like is it similar to the way sort of finance looks at DeFi? like they're a little bit reluctant to adopt it they think it's a little bit scammy or or are they like wholeheartedly sort of like throwing a lot of resources in this so that they can really sort of like be at the forefront of this tech there's certainly a big difference, I think, in the promotional activities around Web3 games, just in terms of how much of a splash they're looking to make versus last year. There was so much hype last year. People were trying to launch uh, a lot of tokens and do a lot of speculative upfront primary sales, which meant a lot of noise. I think people are now more focused on building games that have ROAS. So can they profitably grow and can they have sustainable economies? I vastly prefer that. I think this is a very healthy shift in the industry. The game developers we have applying to us today are a very different profile or composition than a year ago. A year ago, it was mostly DeFi devs or people who have been able to raise cash who were trying to build a, a game on top of it. And some of them will succeed, but most of them don't have the experience and build, like, unless you've shipped a game to, you know, 10 million people, we're not that interested in in sort of, uh, or, or we rate our confidence of, of you succeeding a lot lower, which I think is, you know, just an inherent fact of the game. It's a very specialist uh, job is, is sort of shipping successful games. The majority of people building today are now people who have successfully built things before who are incorporating Web3 into their economies. And um, we much prefer that. And I think their their goal of sort of how do they drum up as much fanfare pre-launch as possible is less. Um, the, the data point we see, Seb, is, you know, over the last four months, which we call a cycle, we've onboarded more games than any other cycle in Immutable's history, more than our, you know, the peak run, et cetera. And, and obviously part of this is the increase in market share, but we are still seeing a very healthy uh, flow of, of sort of credible Web2 developers. Um, in terms of how we think about the market and sort of incumbents approaching it, I think there's two things. One is, there, you know, some of the names you mentioned are already building a Web3, they've already launched projects. Uh, I think the West will have a sort of buy, build, partner analysis approach, which is how do they hedge the risk uh, in the future of, of knowing how to build successfully in Web3 without throwing all their eggs in the basket right now? Because it doesn't make sense that the beneficiaries of the current model, they are the incumbents who are able to sell $100 billion of digital assets without ever having to back the value of those assets as a liability in the future, without having any ongoing obligations. So of course, it's a model that they're a fan of. And these are risk minimizing enterprises. Uh, but that being said, out of the top 20 Western developers you could think in the world, a team would have full-time large teams staff to look at Web3 games whether it's now, whether it's longer term. You just had Zynga announce Sugartown and obviously some of these with, with Asian roots. But um, I, I think that kind of leads into how we see the large studios in Asia approach this. And you literally have in Korea, Nexon, one of the largest gaming studios in the world, putting their flagship IP, MapleStory, on the blockchain. Uh, you have Fumio Kishida, the Japanese prime minister, saying Web3 is the new form of capitalism and identifying NFTs and Web3 gaming 
as one of five core areas of national interest. You have MUFG, uh, Mitsubishi Group, investing in Web3 gaming. So we, we see really interesting leading metrics from Asia. And this makes sense because Japan and Korea have always been at the vanguard of shifts in distribution rather than reacting to it. They were the ones who ushered in the free-to-play uh, new game design genres. They were the ones who helped to usher in a lot of social gaming. And I think they see themselves as, hey, if we can, you know, if we can win on this, um, this will be a huge boon. And, and, and this is a really important experimentation for, for players' benefits. Um, the final note I'll just say on all of this, Seb, is like, I, I really believe Web3, you know, Web2's margin is Web3's opportunity. And that's the case in gaming. So the people who will be most motivated are not number one. It's number two. It's the underdog. And in gaming, there's many of these and, and they're reasonable sizes, but we think it's going to be, just going to the lights on back here. Uh, we think it's going to be companies who want to compete with the biggest incumbents in the world by leveraging the growth strategies of Web3. And we've just seen, in my opinion, the most interesting real world of example of this, of token-driven user acquisition ever play out, which is with WorldCoin, where they were able to effectively like bootstrap from nothing a giant token and then leverage the paper FDV to incentivize 20 million people to scan their redness. Like, say what you will about whether you think it's dystopian or, or utopian, it's an incredibly effective way to essentially do a, a, a vampire attack uh, in real life and, and have massive incentives while giving people ownership of the underlying network. Cool. Well, let's, uh, I mean, this, is, this is really interesting and I, I'd, lo- I'd love to spend more time kind of like asking, you know, talking about the market and where you think this is going. But I do want to talk about the tech a little bit and talking about it immutable as a, as a developer platform. Um, you guys are doing some really interesting things there um, and have just announced the ZK EVM on Polygon. It just so happens we had Sandeep on uh, last week or two weeks ago uh, to, to talk about the po- Polygon's uh, work in ZK. So yeah, what is Immutable as a product? Like who is this product for? And like, you know, talk about the different aspects of this product and how they're uh, how they're useful for people who want to get into it through gaming, you know, either new Web3 developers that are looking to, to build a game or existing gaming developers uh, that want to shift to you know, Web3 economies. For sure. So Immutable is, we describe it as the one-stop shop for Web3 uh, games. If they want to build anything, uh, we can service it. Everything from having an incredibly easy wallet to onboard their customers, to having uh, the entire blockchain design done for them, uh, to be able to use any marketplace instantly via our global order book. So if you list an asset for sale on Immutable, it lists on every marketplace that integrates Immutable, which means you're vastly increasing your volume and it's a much better platform for marketplaces because they have much more volume that they can take fees on. We have things like enforceable royalties uh, and mints so that you can easily run a primary sale or you can easily take ongoing clips of assets no matter where they trade, if that's a really important part of your business model, like it is for you know Digidaidaku or uh, some of these bigger games moving in from Web 2. Uh, and all of this kind of comes back to we're trying to operate at the most important layer of the stack where we can help unify what would otherwise be six different technical choices. And this is a really important reason behind why we did this Polygon partnership. You know, at the end of last year, Polygon was by far our our biggest competitor for gaming. We we both had roughly 40% market share. Uh, We were both competing pretty viciously in market and, you know, grad pricing was going up astronomically for top deals. We had this vision of saying, well, actually, there's no reason for us to have to compete. We could have it so that players can use the immutable platform and under the hood, they could be using the immutable ZKVM, which leverages uh, Polygon's uh, ZKVM technology. And and by far, they are the best developers of this in in the world right now. They're the closest to production. Vitalik has said this a couple of months ago. Um, And by combining the two, we just simplify the developer choice hugely. I I think that's why our, our win rate has essentially doubled over the last six months since launching this partnership. And why we've been able to have such you know success in the market and the reason i like that is it means game these games spend less time wasting around what technical infrastructure should i use and more time building quality games and then the final really important part to immutable and i think probably what resonates with these game developers the most is we are gamers and we build games i think the reason why even though we started out with far less funding than any major blockchain in market you know uh and and we pretty much until um, early last year didn't have any war chest that was akin to these and obviously we now have a pretty sizable war chest um the reason we are able to compete and and gain this market share is you know the solanas the world the the you know eoses whoever was relevant back then they cared about everything they cared about winning DeFi, pfps collectibles gaming uh rwas 
all we cared about was winning gaming and helping to usher in, you know, real property rights for the 3.1 billion gamers around the world. We had built several games internally. We're, we're now publishing three more. And I think that radical focus meant that we built a product that was fundamentally designed for this use case, but that we also understood things on the ec economic side. If they were struggling with the app store, we were struggling with the app store because we were also at the call face building things with them. And I think that's been really essential to the, the sort of uh, DNA of our product and product teams today as well. Let's talk about the underlying platform here. Uh, so I, I learned that there's basically like two rollups, right? There's Immutable X that's uh, built on Starkware and you guys just launched this ZK AVM on Polygon. Uh, why did you, you know, shift to Polygon? What was the, what was the impetus to do that? And, you know, what will, is the idea for Immutable X to be phased out or, you know, are, are there still sort of like some types of customers that want to use Immutable X? Both, both are continuing to, to, to run. We, we maintain and upgrade both of them continuously. And um, I, I think, you know, StarkX is a exceptional technology as well. And um, ultimately we, we needed to solve a couple of things. Um, we needed to solve an EVM compatible uh, offering. So before then, the only ZK technology, and we wanted to go with ZK for security reasons, was an app specific rollup which meant you couldn't just use Solidity or copy paste your contracts from either one. Uh, and that was the choice that we had to make. I'm, I'm very happy with that choice. But now we have the first ZK EVMs coming on market and it's essential for us to have this product offering. Ultimately, we still think 90% of developers will build using APIs. But the people building now and a lot of the hardcore, uh, you know, more advanced game development companies, or DeFi companies want to build uh, with their own smart contracts, which means EVM compatibility makes this a lot easier for them. But the second thing was more pragmatic, which was sort of by, by partnering with uh, Polygon with their CK EVM technology, we were able to provide this joint offering to game developers, which was this end game tech stack and also this end game commercial stack where they could find it much easier rather than having to choose between Polygon or Immutable, they could simply have a unified solution. And I think that's, you know, pretty much everyone who's uh, originally deciding between the two has come to us and said, it's so much easier now. Like we, we find this much better. We get support from both. Uh, we're, we're able to be much more successful in market. So I, I think partially a, you know, a product decision. I think that, that um, CK AVM technology is exceptional. They obviously had what I think is one of the most successful examples of m and in the Web3 history, buying three CK teams uh, two years ago um, for roughly a billion dollars all up. And, and, and those teams have now turned into the, the kind of CK technologies we're using today. But also on the commercial side, it just makes a ton of sense. How is this going to improve the developer experience? And I guess, you know, for, for a, let's say like a, a, a traditional game developer who wants to you know, incorporate Web3 aspects into their game, you know, they might choose something like Immutable. And what's the learning curve for that developer to have to you know, learn to build EVM smart contracts, all the concepts? That that introduces security reentrancy, like all these all these things, right? That like takes people years to to uh, to learn. Um, how how's that fair for traditional web uh, gaming developers that are uh, entering the immutable ecosystem? The cool thing is that you can use smart contracts if you want to, but you don't have to. And in fact, you can sign up and create a web three game while never writing a smart contract. You can use APIs uh, for minting and for trading. You can basically uh, use our template contracts and, and soon be sort of almost entirely automated for deployment of, of collections and manage them via APIs. We have much more to share here with Immutable Hub, where eventually you can manage all of this through a GUI. And I, I think that is incredibly important. So our vision has always been make this as dead simple as possible for developers. Uh, we have a very high NPS on, on that, but we're sort of working continuously to, to make that develop, uh, to make that easier. And I think as soon as we hit this inflection point from this being a really interesting sort of heavily funded niche of game design to being a horizontal, because this is not a vertical, right? Web3 gaming is not going to be a category. Web3 is going to be the way you own assets and multiplayer games. And at that point, this has to be just be like building incredibly easily on Unity SDK or in Unreal or with Stripe-like APIs. Um, and so a lot of what we also do is our ecosystem integrations. We have integrations coming out of the box from day one, the ZKVM mainnet for Unity and for Unreal, where you can basically leverage our SDK from day one. Interesting. And so, you know, the so talk about a bit about the SDK and like what's what's possible to to do with the SDK. Like, you know, 
So you're building a game. Would you want to start using that SDK early on? Or is it possible to take like an existing game and sort of like strap on the SDK toward in order to incorporate some Web3 mechanics? Yeah. So look, majority of the stuff right now is initiating things like transfers, trades, uh, mints, uh, even things like forging. So you take, say, five assets, you destroy them and you, you mint something um, that it's required input output. And that's like upgrading, say, you know, five common alluvials into a rare alluvial. Uh, five common gods on chain cards. Uh, and we, we've even launched things like permissioning, where you can basically have this done automatically under the hood up to a certain value threshold, which is how we think about decentralization. Um, so users can always set kind of almost the, the parameters for how much they're happy for the game to sign on their behalf. And then they can kind of say, well, I, I want to, you know, uh, specifically approve or sign things above a certain value threshold, which to me makes a ton of sense. And it's the right balance between the two, as long as they're always the ones in control. And the technology is architectured to be self-custodial. Um, so the, the vision is you, you'll be able to initiate all of this incredibly easily through like SDKs we expose through pretty much every version of, uh, of Unreal, of Unity, uh, and obviously trying to work with the, the app stores as well. What's it like working with the app stores? Because I, I realize it's probably, well, one of, one of the big challenges is of uh, uh, you know, for, the, for the Web3 gaming space is uh, some of the barriers of having the work particularly i think with apple or having apple sort of approve certain types of um of applications is, is that getting better do you think or uh, are we still sort of in the same place we were a couple of years ago so the trend is toward more open permissions for app stores for digital assets and lower fees we will see exactly how that plays out and another crystal ball but you know here's some really interesting things one, you have a lot of increasing economic pressure. There are more alternatives for people to download things. You have the EU forcing sideloading within the EU, which is a, you know, a really big deal um, of apps. So you'll, you should be able to download apps through, through any app store, not just the, the one provided on the device. Uh, you have Google uh, basically uh, allowing NFTs inside of their apps, which I think was a pretty landmark announcement. I um, mean, that provided just a ton of, of sort of compliance clarity to a lot of people building. And now a lot of people are building for sort of Android first onboarding. Uh, you have Epic Store, which is very pro Web3 as well. Uh, you have, you know, already, I think 20 Web3 games live on there. Gods Unchained went live on there in the last few months, um, which is a massive source of distribution. So I, I think there's this really interesting sort of pressure mounting on the biggest incumbents as to how they can actually clarify permissions and fees. Um, ultimately, you can use, say, the iOS store today if uh, you, you do two things. One is off-platform NFTs uh, not used or usable the utility inside the game. And the second is you pay clips on these assets uh, and, and you know you just kind of pay the, the Apple tax. It's very tricky, obviously, with secondary market that's went to, to sort of add a tax onto it. So um, I'm pretty bullish on where this is going to get to over the next few years. I think there's already sufficient clarity for people to launch mobile-first games. We're certainly focusing on it at this point. I think they're going to be the first ones to mainstream success. But uh, you, that is kind of the the billion or trillion dollar question is how will App Store rules interact with this uh, open ecosystem? So I, I'd like to also talk a bit about um, Passport, which is your, I guess, like non-custodial um, sign-in or wall identity solution. Yeah. What is Passport and what's, what technology is it leveraging uh, MPC? Um, yeah, how does that work? It does. So Passport is our easy onboard wallet that is completely self-custodial and is your universal wallet for every single game or marketplace or wallet you interact with. And this is our vision of before Passport, the only easy onboarding wallets you had used a single state MPC system where in order to both maintain security but also have easy user experience. They basically generated a new wallet per user per game. They could give that game escalated privileges for transactions because it was localized to that game's ecosystem, but it meant that for security reasons, you can't expand that to your general funds. And this is obviously terrible. If a user plays 10 games, you have 10 different wallets and there is no unified liquidity or network value being created. If I'm onboarding into Web3, I can't use that cash to go buy assets from, you know, another game. Like in Counter-Strike Go, I can't trade with someone in League of Legends particularly easily. Uh, and so our vision with Passport was to solve that problem while not compromising on self-custody, 
and while not compromising on user experience. Uh, and the way we solve this is with a multi uh, seek architecture system. It leverages two MVCs. Uh, one is in Immutable's custody, and we actually act as basically a, a guardian. So we basically will refuse to sign transactions that don't comply with the either the economic missions that you've set or a, a general set of um, sort of heuristics we use to, to analyze bad behavior. And of course, the other one is the, the user's uh, self-custody, uh, which is held uh, in cloud storage in, in their legal self-custody by our MPC. Um, and the multi-sig architecture, and, and they can it's kind of opt out of this at any point, means you can default to self-custody while still letting them sign up in under five seconds. We've just run A-B tests. This converts 250% better than you know your default wallet, and we're looking to increase this drastically. And, and that's already huge. So you're already spending less than a third in user acquisition costs if you use Passport versus a traditional wallet today for onboarding. So you say it's fully self-custody. I, mean, I, I understand that. Uh, I mean, I'd say it's more of a hybrid custody because Immutable does have like another piece of that shard. So technically, Immutable could, if it wanted to, um, withhold or censor transactions. Or I mean, I guess probably not because you can't see the actual transaction. You can just see the signature request, right? Precisely, and they can always uh, remove us unilaterally. So there's there's no ability for us to say uh, censor transactions if, if we really wanted to. Okay, the user can remove you from from the MPC. Uh, so it's a, it's an opt out system, right? Okay, and are are there because I mean we're dealing with like users that are you know fairly you know not like necessarily super technical. Uh, are there ways for the user to recover their uh, like? Are there recovery mechanisms? Say the user loses access to uh, to their uh, is it like a lo- like an email login or like how how does it work on the user side? Yeah, so we we use OAuth at the moment. So you can log in with Apple, you can log in with Google, you can log in with your email exactly, and it's registered to your to your address. Okay, and so the and so the user then sort of like backs up their shard. Uh, in, you know, in in any number of uh, you know cloud providers, it's encrypted, like with a password, I guess. Yes, u- ultimately th- that's automatically set, like saved in the MPC database associated with your email. If you can access your email, you can access that um, that wallet. But our vision here is really we're taking people to like zero to a hundred or two hundred dollars of value. If you want to store large chunks of value, we think that's the point. You say, well, hey, here like. Here's the options available to you. Here are the risks associated with each. Uh, I, I think that's kind of the way it, it needs to be done. Okay. And are there options? I mean, can you just also decide, like, I don't want to use Passport. Like, I, I have a ledger. I have, like, some other custody solution. I might use, like, an MPC wallet or, like, a custody solution. You can log in with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we support everything out of the box. Um, you know, Passport is just the, the offering that we have. I think the nice thing, nice thing with Passport is because... It integrates in a vertically integrated manner with our control of, say, like the ZK technology and the order book and the wallet. It makes, we can do things like, say, you know, shared sequencing or cross file up liquidity in really seamless ways that other platforms can't because they only have one layer in the stack. And so our vision is no matter what asset you're trading on any marketplace, on any game, on any roller, using any wallet, you could do so atomically and seamlessly. Uh, with no loss in, in security or, or, or sort of uh, custody with anyone else. Um, and, and this is this vision of this sort of universal liquidity for, for digital value. Yeah, talk a little bit more about, um, you, we, we talked about this before the show, the enforceable real royalties. Uh, what's, what's that about? Yeah, so this is uh, obviously pretty topical. Um, you have uh, the marketplace wars over the last couple of years. First, as you had the blurs and the, the uh, X2Y2s of the world, basically say, hey, we're not going to respect royalties and suddenly soak up a huge chunk of pro trading volume. Then you have uh, OpenSea come up with some solutions and, and sort of you know contracts people use to, to make sure that they can only be traded these collections on royalty respecting uh, marketplaces um, and, and smart contracts. Um, uh, I, I think this is all indicative of the fact that this really has to be sold as a product layer. Just to kind of understand the problem here, the problem is that when you have assets that are tied to royalty. So like I, 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 I create like some, uh, some suite of assets. I, I put those out on say OpenSea, uh, unless, uh, that contract has royalties built into it at the contract level, you're sort of trusting the, the, the platform to, uh, extract and deliver the royalties. 
Um, that and and that's sort of the issue where if you take those assets somewhere else, if you like just you know send them to someone, those royalties are not being uh, perceived by the the sort of the creator. Precisely. So ba- basically, it's really hard to enforce royalties with traditional NFT smart contracts and NFT marketplaces. There have been various attempts at solving this, but ultimately it appears as though the game theory, particularly on Ethereum layer one, is to converge toward a zero or no royalties world, because that's the world in which you have to be in order to have any meaningful market share as a marketplace. All these pro traders who are doing the vast majority of volume today. Uh, Our approach has kind of been from day one, make this enforceable at the protocol level, uh, which we can we can do due to sort of you know a, a, a couple of things we've designed on Immutable X. It's because you know, we we're, we have a single sequencer. We can kind of enforce these royalties uh, from from day one uh, with Immutable CKVM. It's going to be more of a decentralized solution where you know um, we're we're actually sort of engineering the ways that uh, smart contracts respect royalties and, and people can can opt in. Um, but I think both the principles are we firmly believe that enforceable royalties have to be available protocol wide in order for marketplaces to be able to fairly compete and gain their market share and game developers to be rewarded. And the the thesis is quite simple, which is, you know, if you have Counter-Strike Go or Magic the Gathering, Magic the Gathering has an estimated secondary market cap of 10 to $20 billion of cards. But every year they've got to make new, more impressive cards than everything else in existence, making them less valuable. Yeah, I got to sell, sell my old Magic cards. Yeah, like they're, they're, they're tremendously valuable, right? But MTG, the company, has no way of tapping into that, the value of what they've created. That's why they have to basically dump on everyone else every year by creating this new, more powerful stuff. And so suddenly we can have a business model that doesn't rely on that. That's like, hey, Magic just gets 5% of every trade. Magic's only incentive would be increased volume, which might mean make new cards that make the game better and grow the player base. It might mean throwing more tournaments, might mean creating an esports league, whatever they can do to increase the, the value to players of that economy. And so you have complete incentive alignment even though it can be an incredibly profitable system. So that, that's why I've been so passionate about it, is it actually enables a much better, more incentive-aligned business model that we must protect in order to, you know, essentially not have adverse selection uh, or this kind of, you know, tragedy where we, we do a short-term benefit to players by giving them cheap trades, and then there's no incentive for game developers to build or to build based on this much better business model. So why is it that this is not enforceable at the smart contract level? I mean, couldn't we just build like a better ERC721 kind of contract or that would enforce royalties? Is that possible? It, it is, but it's just very hard to enforce if the collections themselves aren't uh, originally A, sort of um, written to be to be opt-in to those smart contracts. And so a lot of the volume, say, in NFTs has been the legacy collections, which were incorporated into this. Um, so I think that's partially what, what has driven this decision with OpenSea. Uh, but B, the, the, the kind of more... Simple solution is if it's relying on individual, say, marketplaces or, or individual collections to make this decision, it's just going to be an incredibly fraught debate. The answer just has to be sort of protocol wide. This is a, an available standard that that can be enforced. Okay, so you guys enforce this by having the sequencer uh, include the the sort of the royalty or like extract the royalty uh, when uh, when building the block. Precisely. So that that's on a. Immutable X on, on StockX, uh, absolutely roll up, but we can do that. On Immutable ZKVM, we're going to have a, a slightly different approach. Um, I think we'll be we'll be sharing more details soon. Okay, cool. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the token. So this, this IMX token, um, which, uh, which is actually like, yeah, trading today. And, you know, the, I checked, there's like $13 million of trading volume uh, somewhere around that. And, you know, Actually, I, I found the token price, like you know, over time has stayed, I guess, like pretty consistent, except for you know one one peak where I guess probably during the during the bull market, but um, hasn't uh, hasn't lost a lot of its value compared to I guess like when it was initially launched. So I guess that's it's a good good thing, I guess. Um, how much do you think of that volume is speculators, and how much is is tied to actual platform activity? And I guess maybe a precursor to that question is what's the token use. What's the utility of the token? Yeah, look, so the, the, the token's utility is basically um, Immutable operates very differently to most other blockchains in terms of our business model. Um, rather than having, say, a, sort of this, this uh, L1 uh, chain thesis um, around value accruing to the, the token, the chains. And we will, obviously, IMX is going to be the core gas currency of Immutable ZKVM. I think we're now 
you know, capturing a lot of that narrative, which is really interesting. But our philosophy has always been, we think a much better and much more aligned business model is to make the most, most liquid value add platform possible for Web3 games and take 2% of every trade. Uh, and, and this way we can build something that has completely aligned incentives with developers when they make money or when users trade when making money. Uh, and every single time those assets are traded, 20% of the fees must be paid for an IMX. And so IMX actually, actually has sort of, you know, clear fundamental utility, um, which I think is, you know, people can sort of uh, look at that and, and sort of, you know, build their utility models around um, rather than sort of alternatives in, in market. So that's that's our utility. That's been uh, the clear goal since day one is to really have this integral into the protocol and, and how we add value to every single trade. And then, yeah, the, the volume, you know, how much of the volume you think is, or do you have a sense of, is that something you're tracking somehow? I mean, like how much of that is tied to actual activity on the platform and how much of it is uh, speculative? Well, the vast majority would be people uh, trading based on, uh, you know, what, what they, they sort of uh, perceive the utility to be. Um, I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily call that speculative, uh, but, you know, I can, uh, up to the reader's interpretation. I, I, I think the most important thing is this thing has a clear utility, right? Kind of that we've, we've uh, set in stone since day one. Um, and our vision is to construct really just some of the most sensible tokenomics in the world. So the, the few things that really excite me about the token, um, obviously Immutable, you know, doesn't generate this. This is run by the Digital Worlds Foundation, but is one, every single person who trades on Immutable can own part of the protocol. And that's because if, you know, every single time you trade, you're earning IMX tokens. Uh, and the vision of this is really cool because you have 3.1 billion gamers. If this takes off, everyone can own a part of this open ecosystem of what the future of digital property ownership is going to be. And I, that's that's probably my, my favorite thing. Um, and the second thing, you know, you talked about how the, the price has been quite stable. Um, obviously, you know, not here to comment on prices, but uh, the the circulating supply is much higher than most alternatives. It's, it's, it's sort of um, used a lot more. And we've been able to maintain that ranking or improve that ranking from 150 to 50 over the last year in circulating supply, even despite everything unlocking. I think that's because uh, of, of sort of the, you know, the, the, the utility and the long-term alignment we have from holders today. Uh, and then the final thing I'd say is that uh, obviously the vast majority of IMX allocated to ecosystem grants, the vast majority of these grants, all of which are issued by the foundation, are almost completely underwritten. So we don't just give them out uh, for, to games in exchange for, for grants. The games actually have to deliver volume to the protocol in order to earn those grants. And right now, in order for roughly 180 million of tokens which have been allocated, over $12 billion in protocol volume has to be achieved in order for them to even be given out. Um, so in terms of ecosystem uh, allocations, we run, you know, the recommendations here are incredibly efficient in terms of how they're structured for grants versus returns. And game developers love it because they know that ultimately, you know, that there's no supply just going out there, no value being brought. Everyone has to contribute to the ecosystem in order to sort of end up owning part of the protocol, which I think is, is really important. Very cool. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe to wrap up here, what is the, um, yeah, what's the roadmap and uh, what should people be sort of looking into when it comes to Immutable? How can people follow the protocol also in the project? And um, yeah, any uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, look, uh, Testnet just went live two weeks ago. We have pretty much every game on the platform signed up to Passport. We've just done our biggest uh, quarter of onboarding games ever in the company's history off the back of this Polygon announcement, basically you know, increasing our win rate by 75%. Um, we've got over four years of runway, way over the long term, but it takes a year to get to that hit or four, and um, we're here to change digital ownership for good. Uh, and, and the thing I'd say is, look, coming up, we have uh, mainnet in quarter four. We've got uh, God's Unchained going mobile end of this year, Build of Guardians, Shardbound, uh, Infinite Victory, all immutable titles being published end of this year. And we've got a ton of our biggest games on the platform um, on the rise. Yeah, across the ages, number one in, in France, a uh, strategy game and in Australia, um, you have uh, Alluvium going out of their open beta imminently, probably one of the most hyped games in, in Web3 right now. Um, we're really just excited by the continued raise of, of the caliber of quality uh, of, of games right now. And, you know, as I said, you can't wave a magic wand on, on the timelines, but it's pretty clear that a single hit is going to pull gasoline on everything and, and catalyze what has already been a very heavily invested in, in category. So 
personally, we're actually thrilled uh, with with the pace and, and progress of things. I think it's just continued to build through despair and to help people get to these hits faster, more profitably, and more sustainably. Great, Robbie. Thanks for for coming on and uh, telling us all about Immutable, and also, I, I mean, I've learned a ton about uh, about web through gaming. So this has been great. Thank you. Thanks, Seb. Thanks for having me. Pleasure.